Galleon of First Stage Production EN's group Avalon. And today, we're doing something a little bit different than we usually do. Um, right now, beside me, I've got a nice cup of Earl Grey and a few stories that I'd like to tell. B Gem's kind of loud. How's that? Is that a little bit better? Does that sound better now? I was just working on the volume right before I started, and I wanted to make sure that it's a good listening level for everybody. I'm still a little bit quiet. Okay. Then for this stream, I'll get rid of the limiter. And hopefully that helps out a little bit. Maybe it didn't, I can't tell. Test, 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 test. I'll turn the music down a little bit more if I'm too quiet then. They're just not used to the soft captain voice. Then does this sound fine? Quieter beach in would still be good. I'll do it just by just a smidgen less. Just a smidgen less. You might want to turn up the uh, headphone volume tonight because um, this is about as loud as I'm going to go. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, um, tonight I'm going to try to also be as relaxed as I would like for you guys all to be. Like I said, I have a cup of Earl Grey beside me to make sure that my throat is nice and warm and lubricated. And, um, let's just sit back, grab a blanket. Um, today was a little bit funky for me. I don't know. Personally, I was in a little bit of a of a down mood for no reason, no reason in particular. But um, typically when I like to feel, or not when I like to, when I do feel down, what I like to do is usually find things that are a little bit sadder because for some reason, like sad things when you're sad are, are sort of comforting in a way. It's kind of like, um, if you are sad, but you're surrounded by like a ton of like happy people, it sort of makes you feel bad about your situation, right? So, you know, sharing misery sometimes is really comforting in a way. Um, and that's what the stories tonight are sort of leaning towards is if you've had a bad day, um, these stories aren't supposed to be the happiest. Not all of them have good endings, but there's also an inherent beauty knowing that not everything is perfect, you know? Um, I'm going to read Super Chats at the end of the stream. Please make sure I don't forget. I don't want to be interrupted, you know, with the flow, but thank you very much. I'll make sure to get to them at the end, okay? Thank you. <sighs> yeah, don't worry, don't worry, everybody. Pip is asleep right now. It's way past your bedtime. Um, the first story that we're going to be going through, I've actually got an entire bibliography of all of the um, grim fairy tales right here in front of me. And just going in order through all of them, there's a total of 62. And it starts with the golden bird, which I didn't even think about it until just this moment, but what a start, right? <laughs> It just makes sense. All right. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and get to reading. Okay, there we go. The Golden Bird. A certain king had a beautiful garden, and in the garden stood a tree which bore 
golden apples. One sec, let me move chat to the side so I can see you guys better. I don't want to ignore you guys, even if we are reading today. <laughs> but there's going to be not a lot of chat interactivity today. Thank you for your understanding. Um, today is supposed to be a day where you just relax and listen. Um, and just enjoy. These golden apples, I'm sorry, these apples were always counted. And about the time when they began to grow ripe, it was found that every night one of them was gone. The king became very angry at this and ordered the gardener to keep watch all night under the tree. The gardener set his eldest son to watch, but about 12 o'clock he fell asleep. And in the morning, another of the apples was missing. Then the second son was ordered to watch, and at midnight he too fell asleep. And in the morning, another apple was gone. Then the third son offered to keep watch, but the gardener at first would not let him, for fear some harm should come to him. However, at last he consented, and the young man laid himself under a tree to watch. As the clock struck twelve, he heard a rustling noise in the air, and a bird came flying that was of pure gold. And as it was snapping at one of the bat at one of the apples with its beak, the gardener's son jumped up and shot an arrow in it. But the arrow did not but the arrow did the bird no harm. Only it dropped a golden feather from its tail, and then flew away. The golden feather was brought to the king in the morning, and all of the council was called together. Everyone agreed that it was worth more than all of the wealth in the kingdom. But the king said, One feather is of no use to me. I must have the whole bird. Well, the one feather is worth the entire kingdom's fortune. That's really stupid. I'm sorry. Um, You must have a really crappy kingdom. <laughs> the gardener's eldest son set out and thought to find the golden bird very easily. And when he had gone but a little way, he came to a wood. And by the side of the wood, he saw a fox sitting. So he took his bow and made ready to shoot at it. Then the fox said, Do not shoot me, for I will give you good counsel. I know what your business is, and that you want to find the golden bird. You will reach a village in the evening, and when you get there, you will see two inns opposite to each other, one of which is very pleasant. Excuse me. One of which is very pleasant and beautiful to look at. Go not in there, but rest for the night in the other, though it may appear to you to be very poor and mean. But the, thun so but the son thought to himself, What can such a beast as this know about the matter? So he shot his arrow at the fox, but he missed it, and it set up its tail above its back and ran into the wood. Then he went his way, and in the evening came to the village where the two inns were. And in one of these were people singing and dancing and feasting, but the other looked very dirty and poor. I should be very silly, said he. Yo, me when I go on Twitter at 2 a.m.? I should be very silly. If I went to that shabby house and left this charming place. So he went to the... What? What the hell? Was that English? So he went into the smart house and ate and drank at his ease and forgot the bird and his country too. Wow, this guy's like the first case of ADHD. Weren't these written in like the 1700s? This guy literally went to a hotel and forgot about everything, literally everything, 
This is why we have iPhones. To remind us to keep us on track. <laughs> Time passed on, and as the eldest son did not come back, and no tidings were heard of him, the second son set out, and the same thing happened to him. He met the fox, who gave him the good advice. But when he came to the two inns, his eldest brother was standing at the window where the merrymaking was, and called to him to come in. And he could not withstand the, the temptation, but went in and forgot the golden bird and his country in the same manner. Wow. Not one, but two documented cases of ADHD. This is incredible. Time passed on again, and the youngest son, too, wished to set out into the wide world to seek for the golden bird. But his father would not listen to it for a long while, for he was very fond of his son and was afraid that some ill luck might happen to him also and prevent his coming back. However, at last it was agreed he should go, for he would not rest at home. And as he came to the wood, he met the fox and heard the same good counsel. But he was thankful to the fox and did not attempt his life as his brothers had done. So the fox said, sit upon my tail and you will travel faster. So he sat down and the fox began to run, and away they went over stock and stone, so quick that their hair whistled in the wind. When they came to the village, the son followed the fox's counsel, and without looking at him, went to the shabby inn and rested there all night at his ease. In the morning came the fox again and met him as he was beginning his journey and said, Go straight forward, till you come to a castle, before which lie a troop of soldiers fast asleep and snoring. Take no notice of them, but go into the castle and pass on, till you come to a room where the golden bird sits in a wooden cage. Close by it stands a beautiful golden cage, but do not try to take the bird out of the shabby cage and put it into the handsome one. Otherwise, ye will repent it. Then the fox stretched out its tail again, and the young man sat himself down, and away they went over stock and stone, till their hair whistled in the wind. Before the castle gate, all was the fox had said. So the sun went in, and found the chamber where the golden bird hung in a wooden cage, and below stood the golden cage and the three golden apples that had been lost were lying close by it. Excuse me. Then thought he to himself, it will be a very droll thing to bring away such a fine bird in this shabby cage. So he opened the door and took hold of it and put it into the golden cage. But the, bird would, but the bird set up such a loud scream that all the soldiers awoke, and they took him prisoner and carried him before the king. The next morning, the court sat to judge him, and when all was heard, it sentenced him to die, unless he should bring the king the golden horse which could run as swiftly as the wind. And if he did this, he was to have the golden bird given him for his own. So he set out once more on this journey, sighing, and in great despair, when on a sudden, his friend the fox met him and said, You see now what has happened on account of your not listening to my counsel. I will still, however, tell you how to get how to find the golden horse, if you will do as I bid you. You must straight on, you must go straight on till you come to the castle where the horse stands in his stall. By his side will lie the groom fast asleep and snoring. Take the horse quietly, but be sure to put the old leather saddle upon him, and not the golden one, 
that is close by it. Then, the sun sat down on the fox's tail, and away they went over stock and stone, till their hair whistled in the wind. All went right, and the groom lay snoring with his hands upon the golden saddle. But when the sun looked at the horse, he thought it a great pity to put the leather saddle upon it. I will give him the good one. said he. I am sure he deserves it. As he took up the golden saddle to the groom, or, excuse me, as he took up the golden saddle, the groom awoke and cried out so loud that all the guards ran in and took him prisoner. And in the morning, he was again brought before the court to be judged and was sentenced to die. But it was agreed that if he could bring the tither, the beautiful princess, he should live and have the bird and the horse given him for his own. Then he went his way very sorrowfully. But the old fox came and said, Why did you not listen to me? If you had, you would have carried away both the bird and the horse. Yet will I once more give you counsel. Go, straight on, and in the evening you will arrive at a castle. At twelve o'clock at night, the princess goes to the bathing house. Go up to her and give her a kiss, and she will let you lead her away. But take care you do not suffer her to go and take leave of her father and mother. Man, they say romance isn't dead. Just go up to a woman when she's about to take a bath. Give her a kiss and she's all yours. It's just that easy, guys. Come on. Then the fox stretched out its tail. And so away. They went over stock and stone. Till their hair whistled in the wind again. As they came to the castle, all was as the fox had said. And at twelve o'clock, the young man met the princess going to the bath and gave her the kiss, and she agreed to run away with him, but begged with many tears that he would let her take leave of her father. At first, he refused, but she wept still more and more and fell at his feet till at last he consented. But the moment she came to her father's house, the guards awoke, and he was taken prisoner again. <sighs> I need a sip of that for sanity. After that, I need, I need a sip. <clears throat> then he was brought before the king, and the king said, You shall never have my daughter unless in eight days you dig away the hill that stops the view from my window. Now this hill was so big that the whole world could not take it away. And when he had worked for seven days, and had only done very little, the fox came and said, Lie down and go to sleep. I will work for you. And in the morning he awoke, and the hill was gone. So he went merrily to the king and told him now that now that it was removed, he must give him the princess. The king was obliged to keep his word, and away went the young man and the princess. And the fox came and said to him, We will have all three, the princess, the horse, and the bird. Ah, said the young man, that would be a great thing. But how can you contrive it? If you will only listen, said the fox, it can be done. When you come to the king and he asks for the beautiful princess, you must say, here she is. Then he will be very joyful and you will mount the golden horse that they are to give you and put out your hand to take leave of them. But shake hands with the princess last 
Then lift her quickly onto the horse. Behind you, clap your spurs to his side and gallop away as fast as you can. All went right. Then the fox said, When you come to the castle where the bird is, I will stay with the princess at the door, and you will ride in and speak to the king. And when he sees that it is the right horse, he will bring out the bird. But you must sit still and say that you want to look at it to see whether it is the true golden bird. And when you get it into your hand, right away. This too happened as the fox said. They carried off the bird, the princess mounted again, and they rode off onto a great wood. Then the fox came and said, Pray, kill me, and cut off my head and my feet. But the young man refused to do it. So the fox said, I will at any rate give you good counsel. Beware of two things. Ransom no one from the gallows, and sit down by the side of no river. Then away he went. Well, thought the young man, that just happened. No, he didn't say that. He said, well, it is no hard matter to keep that advice. He rode on with the princess till at last he came to the village where he had left his two brothers. And there he had heard a great noise and uproar. And when he asked what was the matter, the people said, two men are going to be hanged. As he came nearer, he saw that the two men were his brothers who had turned robbers. So he said, cannot they in any way be saved? But the people said, no. Unless he would bestow all his money upon the rascals and buy their liberty. Then he did not stay to think about the matter, but paid what was asked, and his brothers were given up and went on with him towards their home. And as they came to the wood where the fox first met them, it was so cool and pleasant that the two brothers said, let us sit down by the side of the river and rest a while to eat and drink. So he said yes and forgot the fox's counsel and sat down by the side of the river. And while he, sus he suspected nothing, they came behind and threw him down the bank and took the princess, the horse, and the bird, and went home to the king, their master, and said, All this have we won by our labor. Then there was great rejoicing made, but the horse would not eat, the bird would not sing, and the princess wept. The youngest son fell to the bottom of the river's bed. Luckily, it was nearly dry, but his bones were almost broken, and the bank was so steep that he could find no way to get out. And then, the old fox came once more and scolded him for not following his advice. Otherwise, no evil would have befallen him. Yet, said he, the boy, I cannot leave you. No, the fox said it, actually. Oops, I misinterpreted. I can't read. Yet, said the fox, I cannot leave you here. So lie hold of my tail and hold fast. Then he pulled him out of the river and said to him as he got upon the bank, your brothers have set watch to kill you if they find you in the kingdom. So he dressed himself as a poor man and came secretly to the king's court and was scarcely within the doors when the horse began to eat and the bird began to sing and the princess left off of weeping. 
Then he went to the king and told him all his brothers' roguery, and they were seized and punished. And he had the princess given to him again, and after the king's death, he was the heir to his kingdom. A long while after, he went to talk, he went to walk one day in the wood, and the old fox met him and besought him with tears in his eyes to kill him, and cut off his head and feet. And at last he did so, and in a moment the fox was changed into a man and turned out to be the brother of the princess who had been lost a great many, many years. That's how it ends. So, I mean, every of these books, every of these stories has their own moral. And very clearly, very evidently, the moral is to, you know, heed warning, listen to those wiser than you, and if you find a fox, start talking to it, strike up a, strike up a beat with it, you know? Maybe it'll tell you some good advice on how to get rich quick. Hmm. Also, um, don't have brothers. They will try to kill you in the end. Also, um, golden saddles are whack. If it's a golden horse, it should have something to contrast its color. Like, gold on gold, uh, it's tacky. That's why you need, like, different colors in between. That's so stupid. Why would you... Why would you put gold on gold? Don't you know color theory? Idiot. Just... Just listen. Listen to the fox. Stupid ass. Okay, I say that though, but my Final Fantasy XIV dragoon literally, literally wore all gold armor, so I'm a little bit of a hypocrite. So... I mean, let me take a sip before we get into the next drink. I mean, the next story. <laughs> yeah, why not use diamond armor on it? Wait. Wait a second, you're onto something there. Give me a second, I'm going to clear my throat. The next story is called Hans in Luck. And if I'm not mistaken, Hans is a common, or at least a yield common German name. So I believe it's a, it's a masculine name, so we're probably talking about a young boy here. Um, a lot of these stories I really haven't actually read before. So this journey we're embarking on together. Yeah, eating before the stream was definitely a mistake. I keep burping. <laughs> I keep burping. My bad. <clears throat> Chapter 2. Hans in Luck. Some men are born to good luck. All they do or try or try to do comes right. All that falls to them is so much gain. All their geese are swans. All their cards are trumps. Toss them which way you will. They will always, like poor puss, alight upon their legs and only move on so much the faster. Did I have a stroke reading that? What the hell was that? I'm gonna read it again. I'm confused. All their cards are trumps, toss them which way you will, and they will always, like poor puss, alight upon their legs, and only move on so much the faster. Okay, yeah, I'm not, okay, I'm fine. The book's weird. That's cool. The world may very likely not always think of them as they think of themselves. But what care they for the world? What can it know about the matter? One of these lucky beings 
was neighbor Hans. Seven long years, he had worked hard for his master. At last he said, Master, my time is up. I must go home and see my poor mother once more. So pray, pay me my wages and let me go. The master said, You have been a faithful and good servant, Hans, so your pay shall be handsome. Then he gave him a lump of silver as big as his head. Hans took out his pocket handkerchief, put the silver, put the piece of silver into it, threw it over his shoulder, and jogged off on his road homewards. As he went lazily on, dragging one foot after another, a man came into sight, trottling gaily along a capital horse. Ah, said Hans aloud. What a fine thing it is to ride on horseback. There he sits as easy and happy as it. There he sits as easy and happy as if he was at home, in the chair by his fireside. He trips a, a why English hard. He trips against no stones, saves shoe leather, and gets on he hardly knows how. Hans did not speak so softly, but then the horseman heard it all and said, Well, friend, why do you go on foot then? Ah, says he, I have this load to carry to be sure it is silver, but it is so heavy that I can't hold up my head, and you must know it hurts my shoulder sadly. What do you say of making an exchange? said the horseman. I will give you my horse and you shall give me the silver, which will save you a great deal of trouble in carrying such a heavy load about with you. With all my heart, said Hans, but as you are so kind to me, I must tell you one thing. You will have a weary task to draw that silver about with you. However, the horseman got off, took the silver, helped Hans up, gave him the bridle to one hand and the whip into the other and said, When you want to go very fast, smack your lips loudly together and cry, Zip! 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 It only said it one time, but it was really fun to say. Hans was delighted as he sat on the horse, drew himself up, squared his elbows, turned out his toes, cracked his whip, and rode merrily off, one minute whistling a merry tune, and another singing, No care and no sorrow, a fig for the morrow, we'll laugh and be merry. Sing nay down dairy. After a time, he thought he should go to a he thought he should like to go a little faster. So he smacked his lips and cried Zip Away the horse went full gallop, and before Hans knew what he was about, he was thrown off and lice and lie on his back by the roadside. His horse would have ran off if a shepherd who was coming by driving a cow had not stopped it. Hans soon came to himself. Excuse me. I'm very burpy tonight. I don't like to. <laughs> I'd really rather not burp into a stream like this type. The horse would have ran off if a shepherd who was coming by, driving a cow, had not stopped it. Hans soon came to himself and got upon his legs again, sadly vexed, and said to the shepherd, This riding is no joke. When a man has the luck to get upon a beast like this that stumbles and flings them off as it sh if... 
Learn punctuation, Hans, please. I'm begging you. This writing is no joke. When a man has the luck to get upon a beast like this, that stumbles and flings him, flings him off as it would break his neck. However, I'm off now once for all. I like your cow. I like your cow now a great deal better than this smart beast that played me like this trick and has spoiled my best coat, you see, in this puddle, which, by the by, smells not very like a nosegay. Okay, a nosegay is a bunch of flowers, everybody. I guess it's like a bed of flowers. I had to look that up just now. I was very confused. <laughs> also, Hans is extremely insufferable, isn't he? Also, also, that last sentence he wrote, he definitely took my advice. He used like 10 commas. Like, I'm serious. Let me, let me, let me count them. One. Uh, let's see. Two, three, semicolon, four, five. It was like five commas and a semicolon. Guy actually took my advice. That's crazy. One can walk along at one's leisure behind that cow, keep good company, and have milk, butter, and cheese every day into the bargain. What would I give to have such a prize? Well, said the shepherd, if you are so fond of her, I will change my cow for your horse. I like to do good to my neighbors, even though I lose it by myself. Done, said Hans merrily. What a noble heart that good man has, thought he. Then the shepherd jumped upon the horse, wished Hans and the cow good morning, and away he rode. Hans brushed his coat, wiped his face and hands, rested a while, and then drove off his cow quietly and thought his barking was a very lucky one. Give me one second. Let me take a drink really quick. Ah. Let's see. I lost my place. Han says, If I have only a piece of bread, Parentheses, and I certainly shall always be able to get that. That's not foreboding. I can, whenever I like, eat my butter with eat my butter and cheese with it. And when I am thirsty, I can milk my cow and drink the milk. And what can I wish for more? When he came to an inn, he halted ate up all his bread and gave away his last penny for a glass of beer. God damn. I wish, man. I fucking wish. <laughs> a penny? Really? Sorry, I'm getting distracted. When he had rested himself, he set off again, driving his cow towards his mother's village. But the heat grew greater as soon as noon came on, till at last he found himself on a wide, a wide heath that would take him more than an hour to cross, he began to be so hot and parched that his tongue clave to the roof of his mouth. Could go, clave. That's a type of music rhythm. A pair of cylindrical hardwood sticks. What? But this is like a verb. Guys, I don't think I know ye old English. The hell is it called? What the fuck is a clav? <clears throat> I can find a cure for this, thought he. Now I will milk my cow and quench my thirst. So he tied her to the stump of a tree. 
and held his leather cap to the milk, or to milk on to. But not a drop was to be had, for it was a male cow, unfortunately. That's not true, it doesn't say that. Who would have thought that this cow, which was to bring him milk and butter and cheese, was all that time utterly dry? Hans had not thought of looking to that. While he was trying his luck in milking and managing the, very, the matter very clumsily, the uneasy beast began to think him very troublesome and at last gave him such a kick on the head as knocked him down, and there he lie a long while senseless. Luckily, a butcher soon came by, driving a pig in a wheelbarrow. What is the matter with you, my man? said the butcher as he helped him up. Hans told him what happened, how he was dry and wanted to milk, the, to milk his cow but found the cow was dry too. The, then the butcher gave him a flask of ale, saying, There, drink and refresh yourself. Your cow will give you no milk. Don't you see she is an old beast? Good for nothing but the slaughterhouse. Alas, alas, said Hans. Who would have thought it? What a shame to take my horse and give me only a dry cow. If I kill her, what will she be good for? I hate cow beef. It is not tender enough for me. If it were a pig now, like that fat gentleman you have driving along at his ease, one could do something with it. Semicolon. It would at no rate, it would at any rate make sausages. Well, said the butcher, I don't like to say no. When one is asked to do a kind, neighborly thing to please you, I will change and give you my fine, fat pig for the cow. Heaven reward you for your kindness and self-denial, said Hans, as he gave the butcher the cow and taking the pig off the wheelbarrow drove it away, holding it by the strings that was tied to its leg. So on he jogged, and all seemed now to go right with him. He had met with some misfortunes, to be sure, but he was now well repaid for all. How could it be otherwise, with such a fine traveling companion as he had last got? The next man he met was a countryman, carrying a fine white goose. The countryman stopped to ask what was o'clock. This led to further chat, and Hans told him all his luck, how he had met so many good bargains, and how all the world went gay and smiling with him. The countryman began to tell his tale and said he was going to take the goose to a christening. Feel, said he, how heavy it is, and yet it is only eight, we eight weeks old. Whoever roasts and eats it will find plenty of fat upon it. It has lived so well. You are right, said Hans, as he waited in his hand. But... If you talk of fat, my pig is no trifle. <sighs> Meantime, the countryman began to look grave and shook his head. Hark ye, said he. My worthy friend, you seem a good sort of fellow, so I can't help doing you a kind turn. Your pig may get you into a scrape. The village I just came from, the squire has had a pig stolen out of his sty. I was dreadfully afraid when I saw you that you had gotten the squire's pig. If you have, and they catch you, it will be a bad job for you. 
the least they will do will be to throw you into the horse pond. Can you swim? Poor Hans was sadly frightened. Good man, cried he. Pray, get me out of this scrape. I know nothing of where the pig was either bred or born, but he may have been the squire's for aught I can tell. You know this country better than I do. Take my pig and give me the goose. I ought to have something into the bargain, said the countryman. Give a, get, give a fat goose for a pig, indeed. Tis not everyone would do so much for you as that. However, I will not be hard upon you as you are in trouble. I can't follow along with this English. They, they just swapped animals again, right? Dog traded a lump of silver for a horse. Horse for a cow. Cow for a pig. Pig for a bird. Is this yet another case of ADHD? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <clears throat> I'm losing my place by getting distracted. Then he took the string in hand and drove off the pig by a side path, while Hans went on the way homewards free from care. After all, he thought, that chap is pretty well taken in. I don't care whose pig it is, but wherever it came from, it has been a very good friend to me. I have much the best of the bargain. First, there will be capital roast. Then the fat will find me a go will find me in goose grease for six months. And then, and then there are all the beautiful white feathers. I will put them into my pillow, and then I am sure I shall sleep soundly without rocking. How happy my mother will be. Talk of a pig indeed. Give me a fine fat goose. As he came to the next village, he saw a scissor grinder with his wheel, working and singing. Over hill and over dale, so happy I roll, work light and live well. All the world is my home. Dude, what the hell? What is their rhyming scheme? It's like A, B, C, B, E. Like, what the... I can't sing this. Then who so blithe, so merry as I? Yeah, okay. Okay, bro. Working and singing my ass. This dude was working and trying. Hans stood, looking on for a while, and at last said, You must be well off, Master Grinder. You seem so happy at your work. Yes said the other mine is a golden trade a good grinder never puts his hand into his pocket without finding money in it but where did you find where did you get that beautiful goose i did not buy it i gave a pig for it and where did you get the pig i gave a cow for it and the cow i gave a horse for it and the horse? I gave a lump of silver as big as my head for it. And the silver? Oh, I worked hard for that seven long years. You would have thriven well in the world hither too, said the grinder. Now if you could find money in your pocket whenever you put your hand into it, your fortune would be made. Very true. But how is that to be managed? How? Why? You must turn grinder like myself, said the other. You only want a grindstone. The rest will come of itself. Here is one that is but little worse for wear. I would not ask more than the value of your goose for it. Will you buy? How can you ask, said Hans. I should be the happiest man in the world 
if I could have money whenever I put my hand in my pocket. What could I want more? There's the goose. Now, said the grinder, as he gave him a common rough stone that lie by his side. This is a most capital stone. Do but work it well enough, and you can make an old nail cut with it. Hans took the stone and went his way with a light heart. His eyes sparkled for joy and he said to himself, Surely, I must have been born in a lucky hour. Everything I could want or wish for comes of itself. People are so kind. They seem really to think I would I do them a favor in letting them make me rich and giving me good bargains. Meantime, he began to be tired and hungry too, for he had given his last penny in his joy at getting the cow. At last, he could go no further, for the stone tired him sadly, and he dragged himself to the side of a river, that he might take a drink of water and rest a while. So he laid the stone carefully by the side on the bank, but as he stopped down to drink, he forgot it, pushed it a little, and down it rolled, plump into the stream. For a while, he watched it sinking into the deep, clear water, then sprang up and danced for joy, and again fell upon his knees and thanked heaven with tears in his eyes for, it, for its kindness in taking away his only plague, the ugly, heavy stone. How happy I am, cried he. Nobody was ever so lucky as I. Then up he got with a light heart, free from all his troubles, and walked on till he reached his mother's house and told her how very easy the road to good luck was. End. That's an interesting story. Um, personally, when I was reading the story, I was thinking to myself, this is probably going to be the moral of, like, holding on to what you have, or at least, well, how do I phrase it? You know, like in mobile games, you could do a 10 pull or a single pull, and sometimes you feel very tempted to do the single pull. Hans kept doing singles. Hans kept doing single pulls and he never got an SSR or a five star. The moral of the story is to save up your premium currency until you can afford a 10 pull. Better yet, keep saving until you can get the, uh, the guaranteed unit that you want. Hans kept doing single pulls, and he'll never get the unit that he wants because he kept blowing all of his luck on singles. <clears throat> I think tonight I'll read us one more story. And I think I'm actually going to pick one. I think it'd be really nice to end it on a story that we all know. Let me refer back to the table of contents. Hmm. The two of those personally, I wasn't very familiar with. I want to... I want to read one that we all know. Hmm. All right. From three of these, I want to read either Hansel and Gretel, Little Red Riding Hood, or Rapunzel. And I think that 
Sorry, I'm, re I'm gonna choose it on my own. <laughs> um, I think tonight I will choose Rapunzel, I think. Rapunzel is chapter 16, so we skipped 13 more to get here. Um, if anyone was curious, I will most likely be doing this again in the future. Not very often, but periodically I would like to do more calming streams like these. So, you can bet on being able to tune into this again, okay? Let me take one last drink before I continue. <sighs> Did you guys know that water is extremely good for keeping your mouth wet and moist? I did. That's why I drink water. for this last one, okay? Chapter 16 Rapunzel There were once a man and a woman who had long in vain wished for a child. At length, the woman hoped that God was about to grant her desire. These people had little window at the back of their house from which a splendid garden could be seen. I wholly regret eating before stream. I keep wanting to burp. This is sufferable. It was, however, surrounded by a high wall and no one dared to go into it because it belonged to an enchantress who had great power and was dreaded by all the world. One day, the woman was standing by this window and looking down to the garden when she saw a bed which was planted with the most beautiful rampion, aka Rapunzel, apparently. In parentheses it says Rapunzel. I believe um, a rampion is like a type of vegetable, like a pump, like a pumpkin or a potato. It's a root. It's just like a root flower. Never mind. No, not a flower, but like, oh, it is a flower. It's a, it's a vegetable. A beautiful ramp, rampion, aka Rapunzel. And it looked so fresh and green that she longed for it. She quite pined away and began to look pale and miserable. Then her husband was alarmed and asked, What ails you, dear wife? Ah, she replied, If I can't eat some of the rampion, which is in the garden behind our house, I shall die. The man who loved her thought, Sooner than let your wife die, bring her some of the rampion yourself. Let it cost what it will. At twilight, he clambered down over the wall into the garden of the enchantress, hastily clutched a handful of rampion, and took it to his wife. So the price was nothing, he just stole it. Good man. She had once made herself a salad of it. <clears throat> she had once made herself a salad of it and ate it greedily. 
It tasted so good to her, so very good, that the next day she longed for it three times as much as before. If he was to have any rest, her husband must once more descend into the garden. In the gloom of the evening, but therefore, he let himself down again. But when he had clambered down the wall, he was terribly afraid, for he saw the enchantress standing before him. How can you dare, said she with an angry look, descend into my garden and steal my rampion like a thief? You shall suffer for it. Ah, answered he, let mercy take the place of justice. I only made up my mind to do it out of necessity. My wife saw your rampion from the window and felt such a longing for it that she would have died if she had not got to eat some. Then the enchantress allowed her anger to be softened and said to him, If the case be as you say, I will allow you to take away with as much rampion as you will. Only I will make one condition. You must give me the child which your wife will bring into the world. It shall be well treated, and I will care for it like a mother. Yo, is this witch like an, like an incel or something? Can she not have kids because, like, she can't get it? So she doesn't have a kid and she really wants one? She's like, probably like, trying her best to go on Tinder and stuff like that. But it just isn't working out because her, her like her profile or her bio sucks. So she's like, screw it. If I can't get a kid with somebody, I'll take someone's kid. I get that. I get that. <laughs> the man in his terror consented to everything. And when the woman was brought to bed, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Huh? The enchantress appeared at once, gave the child the name of Rapunzel and took it away with her. When the woman was brought to bed, like, do they mean, like they, like, oh, they, they doing it. They totally doing it. And then she just yo ye like yoinked the baby. That's kind of crazy. Rapunzel grew into the most beautiful child under the sun. When she was 12 years old, the enchantress shut her into a tower, which lie in the forest, and had neither stairs nor door, but quite a top. But quite at the top was a little window. When the enchantress wanted to go in, she placed herself beneath it and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. <clears throat> Rapunzel had magnificent long hair, fine as spun gold, and when she heard the voice of the enchantress, she unfastened her braided dresses, tresses by the way, not, not dresses, wound them round one of the hooks of the window above, and then the hair fell twenty ells down. Is that like 20 feet? Or what is it? What is an L? L measurement. One L is 45 inches, which is like four feet. So it's like 80 feet tall. That's pretty tall. That's like a seven story building. Actually, no, it's way more than, or it's less than that. It's like probably like five story building, probably. I don't know. Math is hard. And the enchantress climbed up by it. After a year or two, it came to pass that the king's son rode the forest and passed by the tower. Excuse me, water break. I'll get better at reading, I promise. <laughs> I'll make sure to hydrate more beforehand. Then he heard a song which was so charming that he stood still and listened. 
This was Rapunzel, who in her solitude passed her time in letting her sweet voice resound. The king's son wanted to climb up to her and looked for the door of the tower, but none was to be found. He rode home, but the singing had so deeply touched his heart that every day he went out into the forest and listened to it. Once when he was thus standing behind a tree, he saw that an enchantress came there, and he heard how, he, how she cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Then Rapunzel let down the braids of her hair, and the enchantress climbed up to her. If that is the ladder by which one mounts, I too will try my fortune, said he. And the next day, when it began to grow dark, he went to the tower and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Immediately, the hair fell down, and the king's son climbed up. At first, Rapunzel was terribly frightened when, the, when a man, such as her eyes had never yet beheld, came to her. But the king's son began to talk to her quite like a friend, and told her that his heart had been so stirred that it had let him no rest, and he had been forced to see her. That's like stalker behavior. That's like, that's like my fear in the future is like, I'm like Rapunzel stuck in my tower behind my monitor. And then the king's son, AKA like a crazy ass fan, like hears me out of my window one day, out of my cabin window. And they knock at my window and they're like, let down your hair. But the good news is that we have like police for that kind of stuff. Unfortunately for Rapunzel, I think she doesn't have a cop to help her out. <laughs> then Rapunzel lost her fear. And when he had asked her if she would take him for her husband, and she saw that he was young ma when she saw that he was young and handsome, she thought, "He will love me than old Dame Gothel does." That's the first time they refer to her name, Gothel. And she said yes, and laid her hand in his. She said, I will willingly go away with you, but I do not know how to get down. Bring with you a skein of silk every time that you come, and I will weave a ladder with it. A leaf, le I will weave a ladder with it. And when it... Jesus Christ, I can't. And when that is ready, I will descend, and you will take me on your horse. They agreed that until that time he should come to her every evening, for the old woman came by day. The enchantress remarked nothing of this until once Rapunzel said to, said to her, Tell me, Dame Gothel, how it happens that you are so much heavier for me to draw up than the young king's son. He is with me in a moment. Is she, is she stupid? Sorry, I got mad. <coughs> I got angry. Just, what the, f what? <coughs> is she, is she daft? She self-reported. Self what a dumb idiot. I hate this book. <clears throat> Let me read this again. Tell me, Dame Gothel, how it happens that you are so much heavier for me to draw up than the young king's son. Oh my god. I'm gonna sneeze. <clears throat> uh, I hope I caught that in time. I think I accidentally sneezed on stream. I'm so sorry. Oh god. This is the worst relaxing stream of all time. I'm so mad for the young king's son. I'm so mad for him. He is with me in a moment, says Rapunzel. Ah, you wicked child, cried the enchantress. 
What do I hear you say? I thought I had separated you from all the world, and yet you have deceived me. In her anger, she clutched Rapunzel's beautiful tresses, her hair, wrapped them twice round her left hand, seized a pair of scissors with the right, and snip-snap, they were cut off, and the lovely braids lay on the ground. And she was so pitiless that she took poor Rapunzel into a desert where she had to live in great grief and misery. My god, she got Azkaban. As if she wasn't already stuck in Azkaban. On the same day that she cast out Rapunzel, however, the enchantress fastened the braids of her hair, which she had cut off, to the hook of the window. And when the king's son came and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. She let the hair down. The king's son ascended, but instead of finding his dearest Rapunzel, she found the enchantress, or he found the enchantress, who gazed at him with wicked and venomous looks. Aha! she cried mockingly. You would fetch your dearest, but the beautiful bird sits no longer singing in the, in the nest. The cat has got it, and will scratch out your eyes as well. Rapunzel is lost to you. You will never see her again. The king's son was beside himself with pain, and in his despair he leapt down from the tower. The guy jumped. Oops. He escaped with his life, but the thorns into which he fell pierced his eyes. Then he wandered quite blind about the forest, ate nothing but roots and berries, and did not but lament and weep over the loss of his dearest wife. Y'all weren't even married yet. Chill, chill the hell out, dude. It's her fault anyway. Don't, don't feel bad, dude. That's what you get for falling for an idiot, honestly. That's your fault, bro. Thus, he roamed about in misery for some years, and at length came to, a, to the desert where Rapunzel was. Oh, shit. With the twins to which she had given birth. The twins? Wasn't she 12? I'm so glad they don't tell us the the king's son age. I'm gonna just I'm gonna just self ins not, I'm gonna self like canon it. I'm gonna be like, he was also twelve. This guy was also twelve. Okay, we're doing that. <laughs> oh my god, what the fuck? The king's son is twelve in this story, guys. The story that I'm telling, this personal story that I'm telling, he's twelve years old also. They're the same age, yeah, I go with that. Yeah, for sure. You thought meant like older twins from Gothel, like to watch over her? Not she gave birth in a desert. Suddenly you no longer have reading comprehension? Suddenly I wish I had no more reading comprehension. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. Thus he roamed about in misery for some years, and at length came to the desert where Rapunzel, with the twins to which she had given birth, a boy and girl, lived in wretchedness. He heard a voice, and it seemed so familiar to him that he went towards it. Excuse me, hiccups. And when he approached, Rapunzel knew him and fell on his neck and wept. Two of her tears wetted his eyes, and they grew clear again, and he could see, and he could see with them as before. He led her to his kingdom, where he was joyfully received, and they lived for a long time afterwards, happily and contented. Wow, it's a lot different than the Rapunzel that we all know, but they actually had a happy ending, despite 
the curse of the witch. That was actually like a true love kind of moment. That's actually quite wholesome in a way. I'm actually quite surprised. Um, actually, I want to read one more story. I think I want to read one more tonight. Is that okay? <laughs> I say, is that okay? As if you guys have a choice. <laughs> well, that was actually not a bad story. Despite the 12 year old giving birth. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I want to pick one more up. Table of contents. I want to read one more that piques my interest. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's see. What would chat like? There's so many stories. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, how would you feel if we read chapter 57? Chapter 57 is a story called The Salad. <laughs> I think it sounds very nice to read. Let's go to page 263. <laughs> How many pages is this? Okay. This one's not too bad. Okay, everyone. This will be the final story of the night, okay? That's my worst nightmare. Like I said, everybody, <laughs> sometimes you have to read something sad to feel better about yourself. Let me finish off my water. And the tea as well. I had regular tea. Oh, the, the tea's cold now, so it's basically just herbal water. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, you know, Earl Grey doesn't really taste as good when it's not hot. Don't recommend that. Don't recommend that one bit. <clears throat> I feel like there's been something stuck in my throat all day and I feel really bad, so I'm sorry for the lower quality. Thank you for the super chat. Chapter 57 The Salad As a merry young huntsman was once going briskly along through a wood, there came up a little old woman and said to him, Good day, good day. You seem merry enough, but I am hungry and thirsty. Do pray, give me something to eat. The huntsman took pity upon her and put his hand in his pocket and gave her what he had. Then he wanted to go his way, but she took hold of him and said, Listen, my friend, to what I am going to tell you. I will reward you for your kindness. Go your way, and after a little time, you will come to a tree where you will see nine birds sitting on a cloak. Shoot into the midst of them, and one will fall down dead. The cloak will fall too. Take it. It is a wishing cloak, and when you wear it, you will find yourself at any place where you may wish to be. Cut open the dead bird, take out its heart and keep it, and you will find a piece of gold under your pillow every morning when you rise. It is the bird's heart that will bring you this good luck. The huntsman thanked her and thought to himself, If all this does happen, it will be a fine thing for me. When he had gone a hundred steps or so, he heard a screaming and chirping in the branches over him, and looked up and saw a flock of birds pulling a cloak with their bills and feet, screaming, fighting, and tugging at each other as if as if each wished to have it for him 
as if each wished to have it himself. Well, said the huntsman, this is wonderful. This happens just as the old woman said. Then he shot into the midst of them, so that their feathers flew all about. Off went the flock, chattering away, but one fell down dead, and the cloak with it. The huntsman did as the old woman told him, cut open into the bird, took out the heart, and carried the cloak home with him. The next morning when he awoke, he lifted up his pillow, and there lie the piece of gold glittering underneath. The same thing happened the next day, and indeed every day when he arose. He heaped upon a sorry, he heaped upon a great deal of gold, and at last thought to himself, Of what use is this gold to me whilst I'm at home? I will go out into the world and look about me. Then he took leave of his friends and hung his bag and bow about his neck and went his way. It so happened that his road one day led through a thick wood, at the end of which was a, was a large castle in a green meadow, and at one of the windows stood an old woman with a very beautiful lung, with a very you, with a very beautiful young lady by her side looking about them. Now the old woman was a witch, and said to the young lady, There is a young man coming out of the wood who carries a wonderful prize. We must get it away from him, my dear child, for it is more fit for us than him. He has a bird's heart that brings a piece of gold under his pillow every morning. Meantime, the huntsman came nearer and looked at the lady and said to himself, I have been traveling so long that I should like to go into this castle and rest myself, for I have money enough to pay for anything I want. But the real reason was that he wanted to see more of the beautiful lady. And then he went into the house and was welcomed kindly, and it was not long before he was so much in love but he thought of nothing else but looking at the lady's eyes and doing everything that she wished. The old woman said, Now is the time for getting the bird's heart. So the lady stole it away, and he never found any more gold under his pillow, for it lay now under the young ladies, and the old woman took it away every morning. But he was so much in love that he never missed his prize. Well, said the old witch, we have got the bird's heart, but not the wishing cloak yet, and that we must also get. Leave, let us leave him that, said the young lady. He has already lost his wealth. Then the witch was very angry and said, Such a cloak is a very rare and wonderful thing, and I must and will have it. So she did as the old woman told her, and set herself at the window, and looked about the country and seemed very sorrowful. Then the, then the huntsman said, What makes you so sad? Alas, dear sir, said she, yonder lies the granite rock where all the costly diamonds grow, and I want so much to go there that whenever I think of it, I cannot help being sorrowful, for who can reach it? Only the birds and the flies man cannot. Sorry, only the birds and the flies man cannot. If that's all your grief, said the huntsman, I'll take there with all my heart. So he drew her under his cloak, and the moment he wished to be on the granite mountain, they were both there. The diamonds glittered so on all sides that they were delighted with the sight and picked up the finest. But the old witch made a deep sleep come upon him, and he said to the young lady, Let us sit down and rest ourselves a little. I am so tired that I cannot stand any longer. 
So they sat down, and he laid his head in her lap and fell asleep. And whilst he was sleeping, she took the cloak from his shoulders, hung it on her own, picked up the diamonds, and wished herself home again. When he awoke and found that his lady had tricked him and left him alone on the wild rock, he said, Alas, what roguery there is in the world. And there he sat in great grief and fear, not knowing what to do. Now this rock belonged to fierce giants who lived upon it. And as he saw three of them striding about, he thought to himself, I can only save myself by feigning to be asleep. So he laid himself down, as if he were in a sound sleep. When the giants came up to him, in the first pushed him with his foot and said, I'm sorry, the first pushed him with his foot and said, What worm is that lied he I can't read, god damn it. He said, I lost my place. What worm is this that lies here curled up? Tread upon him and kill him, said the second. It's not worth the trouble, said the third. Let him live and he'll go climbing up the mountain. He'll go climbing higher up the mountain and some cloud will come rolling and carry him away. And they passed on. But the huntsman had heard all they said. And as soon as they were gone, he climbed up to the top of the mountain. And when he had sat there a short time, a cloud came rolling around him and caught him in a whirlwind and bore him along for some time till it settled in the garden. And he fell quite gently to the ground amongst the greens and cabbages. Wow, he got sent to a nightmare realm. Then he looked around him and said, I wish I had something to eat. If not, I shall be worse off than before, for here I see neither apples nor pears, nor any kind of fruit, nothing but vegetables. At last he thought to himself, I can eat salad. It will refresh and strengthen me. So he picked out a fine head and ate of it, but scarcely had he swallowed two bites when he felt himself quite changed and saw with horror that he was turned into an ass. And now you guys understand why I don't eat salad, right? The moral of this story so far is all women do is eat hot chip and lie and salads will turn you into an ass. However, he still felt very hungry, and the salad tasted very nice. So he ate on, till he came to another kind of salad, and scarcely had he tasted it when he felt another change come over him, and soon saw that he was lucky to have found his old shape again. Then he laid himself down and slept off a little of his weariness, and when he awoke the next morning, he broke off a head of both of the good and the bad salad and thought to himself, this will help me to my fortune again and enable me to, to pay off some folks for their treachery. So he went away to try and find the castle of his friends, and after wandering about a few days, he luckily found it. Then he stained his face all over brown, so that even his mother would not have known him, and went into the castle and asked for a lodging. I am so tired, said he, that I cannot, that I can go no farther. Countrymen, said the witch, who are you, and what is your business? I am, said he, a messenger sent by the king to find the finest salad that grows under the sun. I have been lucky enough to find it, and have brought it with me. But the heat of the sun scorches, so that it begins to wither. 
and I do not know that I can carry it farther. When the witch and the young lady heard of this beautiful salad, they longed to taste it and said, Dear countrymen, let us just taste it. To be sure, answered he, I have two heads of it with me, and I will give you one. So he opened his bag and gave them the bad. Then the witch took herself, then the witch herself took it into the kitchen to be dressed, and when it was ready, she could not wait till it was carried up, but took a few leaves immediately and put them into her mouth, and scarcely were they swallowed when she lost her own form and ran, braying down, the, braying down to the court in the form of an ass. An ass is a donkey, by the way. For anybody who is unaware, um, an ass is another word for donkey. This is not a joke, by the way. That was me being very serious. Now the servant maid came into the kitchen, and seeing the salad ready, was going to carry it up. But on the, on the way, she felt, she too felt a wish to taste it, as the old woman had done, and ate some leaves. So she was also turned into an ass, and ran after the other, letting the dish with the bu letting the dish with the salad fall on the ground. The messenger sat all this time with the beautiful young lady, and as nobody came with the salad, and she longed to taste it, she said, "I don't know where the salad can be." Did I miss something just now? I feel like the messenger sat all this time with the beautiful. Okay. Then she And as he went, he saw two asses in the court running about, and the lying the salad lying on the ground. Alright, said he, those two have had their share. Then he took up the rest of the leaves, laid them on the dish, and brought them to the young lady, saying, I bring you the dish myself, that you may not wait any longer. So she ate of it, and like the others, ran off into the court, braying away. What the fuck is happening right now? This guy's turning girls into asses. Is that what you call a booty call? Someone just stop me, please. Then the huntsman washed off his face and went into the court that they might know him. Now you shall be paid for your roguery, said he, and tied, all, tied them all three to a rope and took them along with him till he came to a mill and knocked at the window. What's the matter, said the miller. I have three tiresome beasts here, said the other. If you will take them, give them food and room, and treat them as I tell you, I will pay you whatever you ask. With all my heart said the miller. But how shall I treat them? Then the huntsman said, Give the old ones stripes three times a day, and hay once. Give the next who was the servant maid. Give the next stripes once a day, and hay three. And give the youngest who was the beautiful lady, hay three times a day, and no stripes for he could not find it in his heart to have her beaten. After this, he went back to the castle and found, or he went back to the castle where he found everything he wanted. Some days later, the miller came to him and told him that the old ass was dead. The other two, said he, are alive and eat, but are so sorrowful that they cannot last long. Then the huntsman pitied them and told the miller to drive them back to him. And when they came, he gave them some of the good salad to eat. And the beautiful lady fell upon her knees before him and said, O oh, dearest huntsman, forgive me all the ill I have done to you. My mother forced me to do it. It was against my will, for I had always loved you very much. Your wishing cloak hangs up in the closet, and as for the bird's heart, I will give it to you too. But he said, keep it. 
it'll be just the same thing, for I mean to make you my wife. So they were married and lived happily ever after till they died. <sighs> uh, closes book sound effects. The moral of the story, everybody, I think we can all agree on, is that women really only do eat hot chip and lie. But sometimes they don't lie on purpose. Sometimes they don't do it maliciously. Sometimes the lie is for their own safety. And we can look past that. This goes beyond women, by the way. <laughs> this is beyond women. It's okay to forgive people. And we are able to forgive people. Unless they eat salad. People who eat salad don't deserve forgiveness. And they should be turned into asses and whipped. The real moral of the story is don't eat salad because you never know what might happen next. Thank you everybody for coming to the stream today. Really quick, I'm going to open up the, uh, the couple of super chats that I got and uh, acknowledge them. Give me one moment, please. But don't the others eat salad? You're asking questions. I don't think you should ask them. Because what if... What if they do? What if I have to... <laughs> what, I have, what if I have to whip my, my boys at Avalon? Oh no! Why is this not showing up? Um... The original super chat from Barry isn't showing up on my list, which makes me very upset. But, um, Barry, thank you very much for the super chat earlier. Um, I hate this website. <laughs> to read it off. And, as well as Leech, thank you very much for the super chat. Captain's Laugh is so cute. Thanks for reading to us. Of course. It's been my pleasure today. I'm really glad that uh, a lot of people seem to enjoy this style of content. I know that Gail Galleon's a laughy, goofy guy. I like to poke a lot of fun at people. I joke around and I'm very loud and obnoxious, but it's nice to have this side of me too. Um, the side that you guys don't really get to see. Where I can be very calm and I guess warm. Aaron Light, thank you very much for the super chat. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the cozy stream, Captain. Really loved hearing you read the stories. I'm glad. I'm very glad to have given you guys a cozy day. Um, just remember, guys, anytime you have a bad day, sometimes it's better to think about the things that make you sad. But come to peace with it. It's okay to be sad. And it's okay to be tired. It's okay to be exhausted, upset. Just remember that everything gets better. There's always bright days also. Even if your days are mostly rainy and gr uh, gray and cloudy, not every day is. So you have to take the days that are sunny and make the most of it. There's a Latin phrase that my grandpa used to say, my late grandpa, and it's um, carpe diem, which means seize the day. Um, when I was really young, he used to always tell us when we woke up, carpe diem, let's get out there and make the most of it. And to be honest, I'm not the best at that. <laughs> uh, I get really sad a lot. I get really depressed too. There's a lot of things in life that really suck. Um, and sometimes you can't help but like have your mind sit on that. But just remember that there are people that care about you. And if you're stuck sitting on the bad things, then you'll never get to see the good. 
Alza, thank you very much for the super chat. Thank you, thank you. This was so nice. Thank you, Captain. Of course. I'm glad to have made a nice night for you guys. Salad Supa, thank you, Jesse, for the super chat. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> that was a good story. I like the salad one, actually. Surprisingly. This is the first salad that I enjoyed. Haha. <laughs> Everyone, it's been wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close up shop now. Take the rest of your day or the rest of your night. Um, if you have to think about the things that make you sad, then feel free to. Um, there's no shame in that. Ushi Pudding, thank you very much for the super chat. Thank you, thank you. Such a lovely way to end the night. Looking forward to more of these types of streams. Glad to see a new set of Gale Galleon. That's me. <laughs> yep. Actually, before I end, I have one more tangent that I want to go on to because I'm a yapper. But um, you guys know that my favorite band is Radiohead and Muse. My favorite, my two favorite bands are Radiohead and Muse. Um, if you guys don't know Radiohead music, a lot of their stuff is really, really sad. It's miserable sometimes actually they only talk about the bad shit but um like i said at the beginning of the stream um personally i find it that talking about the bad things is very helpful just sitting with it like i said it's very comforting to know that there's a people out there everyone's got their own struggles you know everyone's suffering in their own ways it's nice it's very comforting to know that and I think it helps me personally move on because we can all get through it it might take a little bit of help from other people it might take a little bit of help from the people closest to you or maybe you just need some time alone but there's always a way past it Have a good night, everybody. Get some good sleep if it's late for you. If it's still daytime, then carpe diem. Seize the day. Make sure you make the most of it. Have a good night. <laughs>